It doesn't matter to him that we're building one of the biggest wind turbines or that we built the first hybrid battery gas turbine or that our technology powers a third of the planet. What matters to him is that it's getting dark and he has homework to do. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ralph Izzo, President and CEO of Public Service Enterprise Group. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And it's a particular pleasure for me to moderate a panel with two folks who need no introduction, but nonetheless, let me just say a few words about them as we begin our discussion on the role of public policy and specifically Congress in bringing about a carbon-free future. Joining me today is United States Congressman Paul Tonko. Mr. Tonko is a six-term member of the US Congress and he represents New York's 20th Congressional District. He is the chair of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change and a co-chair of the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. Mr. Tonko, in addition to his years of experience on the Hill and his decades of experience in the New York legislature, is no stranger to our industry as he was the president and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA. Welcome, Mr. Tonko. Thank you so much, Ralph. Also joining us today is Rich Powell. Rich is the executive director of ClearPath. And if anyone reads about anything in this industry as it relates to uh, a clean energy future, you've seen Rich in numerous forms, whether it's in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Fox News, as he is a strong advocate for market mechanisms to advance uh, and accelerate clean energy innovation into the future. So before I turn it over to our panelists, let me just say a word or two about PSEG and how we view the future of clean energy. Uh, we envision a future where people use less energy even as they do more. The energy that they use is cleaner than ever before and it's delivered with a reliability and a resiliency that's unsurpassed. And we believe that future is motivated by the reality of climate change and a reality that we can reverse and combat by applying five simple principles. Principle number one is the creation of a price on carbon. And through the creation of a price on carbon, the economic and wise implementation of four subsequent measures. First and foremost, economic application of energy efficiency. Secondly, the preservation of existing nuclear plants. Thirdly, the wise deployment of renewables in those places where it makes economic sense. And fourth, the electrification of our economy, beginning with the transportation sector. But I think you don't want to hear from me. I think who you want to hear from is Mr. Tonko and, and Mr. Powell. So let's turn our attention to them. Uh, Mr. Tonko, it's, it's clear that uh, Congress has been paying attention to climate uh, over the past decade, but it seems to be quite a challenging thing to pass comprehensive energy legislation. In fact, when you joined Congress in 2008, it was the year after the most recent piece of comprehensive legislation. Why is it so hard to reach consensus on energy matters in the Congress. Well, Ralph, thanks again for the opportunity to join with everyone here. Um, there's no doubt that the legislative process, just by its design, is, um, is one that is very slow and, and into heavy review. Uh, and that provides for a lengthy outcome sometimes. I, I've been working on some bills that have bipartisan support, including gas turbine efficiency, um, R&D, and uh, the Department of Energy's weatherization assistance program to uh, modernize and uh, improve that. Uh, I've been working on that for, believe it or not, more than a decade. So while that can be frustrating, I like to think we're getting closer to a breakthrough. Senator Murkowski, uh, the Republican chair over on the Senate side, uh, and the House Science Committee uh, in my house have done a lot of great work developing bipartisan bills uh, on energy innovation. And I think there would be room for good contributions from my committee assignment, the Energy and Commerce Committee, on efficiency and items like um, EV uh, infrastructure. Uh, but obviously getting floor time for this effort has been difficult. 
And obviously it has been made even more difficult since we, um, we began working remotely in March because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But when it comes to climate and clean energy, I believe Congress will take its cues from the public. And there's no doubt that public awareness is growing. Climate change was one of the top issues during the uh, recent Democratic presidential primaries. It's an odd feeling since I've been working on these issues for decades, going back to my New York State Assembly days. But energy is now in the midst of it all. It's, uh, it's a hot issue. And if the public, everyone from our various young, uh, very, very young constituents, the millennials and the like, to the nation's largest companies, now are they're all calling for action. And uh, there will be no choice for, from congressional leadership and the next administration, whenever that administration comes into office, but to prioritize legislative action. I think the public will rule as it always has. They will establish those priorities. And I think the energy innovation, climate change opportunities have arrived and are rising in public uh, concern and public awareness. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. So Rich, I didn't do a very thorough job of explaining ClearPath, although hopefully I gave you the, uh, the, the, the kudos and credit that you deserve for your prominence in policy circles. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the organization that was established in 2013 and the di changes you've seen both in ClearPath and the dynamics in Congress over that time? Sure. Well, first, Ralph, thanks so much to you and to EEI for having me. Uh, it's terrific to be doing this actually again alongside uh, Chairman Tonko. I think we had a, sort of a similar conversation, unfortunately, in person last year. I wish we could be having this in person uh, this year, but uh, absolutely, this isn't bad. Um, so it, it's been quite uh, an, an evolution since we set up ClearPath back about uh, uh, six years ago now. So I, I was previously in, uh, in business consulting. I was at McKinsey and Company working on sustainability and energy issues. And uh, when Jay Faison founded ClearPath and, and endowed it um, uh, down in Charlotte, North Carolina, you know, we set out to try and uh, build a uh, genuine conservative approach to clean energy and innovation and a responsible uh, solution on climate change that took global emissions very much into account. And I think over the last few years, we've really seen a coming together on a few of those topics. As the chairman mentioned, there's now really robust bipartisan support for an innovation agenda on clean energy, uh, both in 2018, when Republicans were still fully in control of Congress, and in 2019, when we've had bipartisan control of Congress, there's been really significant uh, new developments on clean energy innovation, whether that's kind of record levels of funding for R&D at the Department of Energy or the major new tax incentive for carbon capture technologies in 45Q or a number of the great you know, authorizing legislation on advanced nuclear, for example, that's made it through Congress during that time. And in this most recent Congress, we've seen a really interesting evolution amongst many conservative policymakers on their uh, positioning on climate and climate risk and, and an acknowledgement as, as some of them have done, but now as virtually all of them are, are, are saying that uh, climate change is real and global industrial activity is a significant contributor and we can't do nothing about it, um, that we're gonna continue to use fossil fuels likely far into the future, but we've got an obligation to do it in a cleaner way uh, every year. And we've got to empower the private sector. And I think probably the most encouraging thing that we've observed over that time has really been in the utility industry. I think we're now up to, uh, somebody from EEI can correct me, I think we're now at 21 utilities that have made uh, net zero by 2050 goals. That's sort of become the new currency in the industry. And so many of them have said, well, we know how to get a lot of the way there. We know how to get perhaps 80% of the way there. What's really missing for us is the technology to get that last leg. And so we are really focused on uh, the federal push to develop those innovative, flexible zero emission technologies, which can help people get get the rest of the way. Yeah, Rich, you just reminded me, I, EEI companies have done a lot and, and, and the number 21 is correct. Uh, but we tend to speak in terms of two groups of emission reduction. There's uh, an 80% reduction by 2050 that many of us understand how to get to with de minimis amount of 
of uh, pain and suffering. I mean, it, it, it's not a walk in the park, but it's doable. And then there's the last 20% that needs additional help. So let's talk about that first 80%, right? Because a lot of people just skip to the 20. What, what do you, Mr. Tonka, and what do you, Rich, think we can do to help capture that 80% uh, sooner rather than later? We'll start with you, Congressman. Sure. Um, certainly, um, I recognize the ambitious commitments made by EEI's members in recent years. It's uh, very much uh, uh, an inspiration and a good tone to have established. Um, and uh, there is that recent trend for emissions reductions. Uh, and we don't, I, I think it's important for us not to take that first 80% for granted. Uh, when I came to Congress over um, a decade ago, um, no one would have believed the cost reductions we have achieved in wind and solar. And we have a lot of work to, um, to do to continue this momentum. And I think with research, uh, we can get even more effective and efficient with, uh, with the renewables. A big part of our efforts, I believe, needs to be uh, in, terming, in determining how we accelerate the deployment of cost competitive, uh, commercially available clean energy technologies in the short term, I think we have an opportunity to provide uh, more certainty in our tax policy and extend the uh, investment in production tax credits. Um, certainly reducing those and um, it would only cause a setback, I believe, in the uh, progress we have made. We can also establish a standalone investment tax credit for energy storage, uh, long-term storage. In the medium term, we need to make certain that offshore um, wind continues to come online and we need to um, streamline the process for transmission upgrades and new constructions to build the modernized grid that will be needed to uh, maintain reliability in what is that 80% clean electricity mix. So I think work that can be done uh, immediately on the Hill in Washington and um, set a tone for short term and uh, longer term goals. Thanks, Congressman. Rich, what do you think? How do we get that 80% under our yeah. belt? So, so agreed completely with the chairman on, uh, on, on a standalone uh, credit for energy storage. I think that's a, a key technology to add that flexibility and alongside uh, variable renewables uh, or uh, the, the kind of credit that's appended to the broader ESIC proposal that a number of a bipartisan set of uh, Ways and Means members um, have proposed, which is a, a permanent incentive for new clean energy technologies that also has a great big storage ITC attached onto the side. I think either of those would be terrific routes um, uh, for that. I also very much agree with the chairman on streamlining transmission. I do worry that we assume that there's all of this variable renewable potential out there, wind and solar potential out there, but as we build more and more, we see social license start to diminish. We see a lot of the best areas developed first, and then we've got to rely on smaller and smaller plots of land further apart, which then rely themselves on more transmission, and that we're, we're ignoring a looming long-term transmission issue that we're not actually going to be able to build, whether that's because the permits can never be issued or the lawsuits hold them up forever or there can't be agreement amongst the states or there's just basic NIMBY concerns uh, as there appear to be all across the country. Um, I'd say two additional things I'd mention are, um, and you know, just to build on the point Ralph made earlier, we, we cannot allow closures of existing nuclear plants uh, prematurely before their, before their lifetime. We cannot be taking big steps backward on 24 seven clean energy you know, if we're going to make it to 80% on any meaningful time frame, uh, we only have one bag of money to do this. And that's a very, very wasteful way to spend that bag of money. Uh, and lastly, I, you know, there's a great deal of benefit we can continue to wring out of the, the transition to more natural gas. And, and so I think there's a social license issue right now with uh, ever more use of natural gas, because I think folks worry about locking in those assets into a zero carbon future. And so I think there's got to be increased use of natural gas. And I think there has to be in parallel, a real effort to both develop the technology and to better tell the story about how one day that whole natural gas infrastructure could also be zero emission. And whether that's, you know, the upstream methane or, 
you know, switching the, the, the form of the molecule that flows through those pipes, you know, changing that into syngas and renewable gas and hydrogen. Um, but, uh, you know, maintaining and building on that infrastructure today is really cost effective and really important. It pairs nicely with variable renewables. And I think that that could be a really valuable asset for us in the future, uh, fully net zero. So, Rich, you touched on it before, and yet uh, you, you, you kind of hinted at it a bit just now, too. So beyond as, as challenging as the 80 percent is, that next 20 percent involves uh, who has the best crystal ball. And in the interest of complete disclosure, I spent eight years of my life studying nuclear fusion, uh, which was supposed to be ready quite some time ago and is not quite there yet. And the importance of federal R&D uh, to advances in technology can't be understated. How do we get that final 20%? Is it, is it R&D? Is it market signals through carbon prices? Is it a combination of both? And uh, please, we'll, well, we'll start. I, I think it's got to be a soup to nuts approach. Um, in some places like fusion, unfortunately, we still probably do need some more basic uh, and very early applied research, although there's a, now actually a thriving commercial fusion industry, um, some of whom might actually have something up and running this decade. Um, and obviously there's, there's ITER over in France, which uh, continues to be to be built and may have something promising for us all in, in the 2030s. So uh, there's, there's definitely basic and applied R&D. I think even more important for a number of these technologies, it's just getting from zero to one. So it's demonstrations. So we need to demonstrate a non-light water nuclear reactor technology, or I, ideally several of them in, in the 2020s. And I actually think we're on a, on a good track to do that. The uh, appropriations bills that um, the House and Senate passed last year started a great big program, which will get us back into the demonstrating nuclear uh, reactor business of two reactor technologies by 2025. Um, knock on wood, we can continue that program going forward. It, it won't be cheap, but I think it's an investment that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we need to demonstrate more carbon capture technology. So we've done it sort of once on a big coal plant in the US. We need to do it on some natural gas facilities um, and industrial facilities um, as, as well, by the way. And uh, we need you know, to also be uh, demonstrating these other alternative forms of flexibility, whether that's you know, enhanced geothermal, the kind of really deep stuff that you could build east, east of the Mississippi, whether that's really long duration batteries uh, or other storage technologies uh, like Form Energy has recently announced, uh, whether that's um, deciding we're gonna explore hydrogen as an alternative platform to electricity in a lot of ways and sort of building up a hydrogen economy and lots of different technologies could flow in to create that zero emission hydrogen. Uh, but we need the demonstrations of all these things and we need some kind of a deployment mechanism or incentive. So it could be that ESIC tax incentive. I actually think what the utilities have started to do, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give some props to Duke Energy in this one, they, they published a rather detailed scenario analysis of how they would get to net zero. And they actually size how much of some of these technologies. They call them Zelfers, zero emission load following energy resources, Zelfers. So, so, and they say that they'll be in the position to buy six gigawatts of a Zelfer, I think I have that number right, in 2040 or deploy it, meaning that they'd really wanna start building it in 2035 and that's 15 years from now. And so that sends a really powerful signal to innovators that there's actually a market out there for this kind of thing. And I think if more utilities could do that voluntarily and start to send those market signals to say, hey, if it's, if it's out there and if it's commercially demonstrated and if it's reliable and if it's affordable, we're, we're gonna buy that thing, that could be very powerful. Interesting. So Mr. Chairman, not, notwithstanding the pressure on, on federal budgets, is, is this a potential area for bipartisan support? To, oh, to abs yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, what we have here, Ralph, is a challenge uh, to the nation and uh, certainly to the federal government to set a tone and to make certain that sound planning is put into play for that difficult last 20%. You know, I agree with Rich that, um, you know, these prototypes that need to be developed uh, take time. Uh, we need to see what we can do in terms of uh, developing new opportunities and, and embracing innovation. You know, having worked at uh, and led NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, I saw a lot of public-private partnerships that did innovative concepts that helped bring us to the point we're at today. And so we need to be, you know, tremendously vigilant in, in carrying forth with this agenda 
for that last 20% beginning now so that we have the support for our, our D&D &D, uh, that will echo uh, throughout both houses and uh, get the work done. I think certainly, um, you know, Rich's mention of, of nuclear. Uh, we have um, uh, a lot of agreements uh, that we should be investing in that are wide range in their activity of technologies. And carbon capture absolutely needs to be part of the discussion and advanced nuclear. Um, we've also worked uh, recently with the hydrogen uh, industry and uh, fuel cell uh, opportunities so that we can provide them equal benefits and coverage of tax policy that will enable them to be uh, more effective partners and um, again, allow for all the uh, options out there to take hold because in order to meet that 20%, we're going to have to encourage everyone to partner in. The uh, improving the cost and performance of energy storage is key too. Uh, we know that we're going to need long duration storage as we transition to a high renewables grid, but um, that long-term storage has, I think, great opportunity for improvements there. Um, as we do with energy efficiency, uh, I would hope we don't think that game is over, that we need to continue to see energy efficiency as our fuel of choice. So while there is emerging bipartisan consensus around technology development, I don't want energy innovation um, to be lip service. It needs to be done in service of a long-term pollution reduction framework. And then we will have the best hope and promise of meeting uh, that difficult last 20%. We need push and pull policies to truly unlock American ingenuity in clean energy technologies. This can be a mix of incentives and technology forcing regulatory policies. But in either case, I think long-term certainty is going to provide um, that roadmap to making these technologies commercially available and, um, and therefore cost competitive. You both touched on two of my favorite topics, the preservation of the existing nuclear fleet and, uh, and, and, and what I believe is an underinvestment in energy efficiency that can be amplified by orders of magnitudes with the introduction of uh, data science and artificial intelligence, uh, making use of the data that we're getting through advanced metering. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit to a topic that I'm a bit conflicted on, and that's the role of states versus the federal government. Uh, my instincts tell me we need a national price on carbon, we need a big market that's as broad as all 50 states to get uh, all of the entrepreneurs and all of the innovators behind us to developing these great new technologies. Having said that, we, you, you spoke candidly, Mr. Chairman, about some of the challenges with getting national legislation. So perhaps it's a good thing that states are taking the lead with renewable portfolio standards to get things going. But yet we have a REGI, a Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that does not overlay with a PJM so you have a carbon market that's different than the electric power market that creates distortions. If the states do a lot, does that reduce the pressure on Congress to do more? Your thoughts on the role of states and the federal government and how they can help or perhaps hinder each other. And we'll start with you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I think certainly the key word that you mentioned there, distortions, that ought to motivate all of us to uh, make certain that there is a federal role here that the federal role brings us into uh, a, a final good outcome. I certainly appreciate all the work being done at the state level. I, I know that there's great work being done at my home state of New York, but we aren't going to be able to achieve our collective goals through any kind of patchwork approach. The first step certainly in establishing um, a federal framework is setting the tone and beginning with adopting uh, targets and making certain that those targets are science-based. Uh, that rejection of science in, at the federal level is very worrisome. And we need to make certain that we uh, establish these targets in a science-based way. The sooner everyone can come together and agree with the emerging consensus of net zero by 2050, we can have that more productive conversation about just how we achieve it. And I strongly believe that regulated entities are going to know best um, how to manage the, uh, this transition, um, knowing their assets. So I think we should look to a framework that provides flexibility 
to allow entities to deal with their unique circumstances. The biggest benefit of this approach is a national economy-wide effort um, where we're going to be able to manage the transition um, uh, at the lowest cost to everyone. Uh, have identified goals of carbon reduction and making certain again that the impact to um, the consumer um, is as minimal as can be. The other benefit I think that, um, that uh, comes with a federal overlay are several cost cutting issues that will need federal support, I believe, and coordination. The um, assisting displaced workers and communities during the transition uh, for some regions is going to require additional resources. And I think the federal um, um, go-to is an appropriate one here. Ensuring that um, environmental injustices, uh, for that matter, are addressed. Certainly resonating as highly, uh, a high priority these days. And they will be addressed again with necessary federal support and enforcement. And um, when it comes to research opportunities, I don't think any one of our states is going to put forward the amount of research funding that will be necessary for us to um, arrive at that net zero by 2050. So I think there's a role here for the federal government and certainly a framework that can be provided that allows us to go forward and um, advance a targeted goal for carbon reduction and, um, and and again, a minimal impact uh, on our consumers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rich, your thoughts on the state versus federal role? Sure, well, I'll, I'll pick up where the chairman left off uh, on the innovation front. Um, you know, the, the, the pool of capital, and I think we should think of it as capital making investments at the Department of Energy is the largest pool of capital focused on clean energy on the planet. Right, so we spend, depending on how you cut it, we spend somewhere between six and $12 billion investing in clean energy research and development and demonstrations uh, at DOE every year. Despite terrific programs like NYSERDA in New York and all of the work done in Texas and California at the various energy institutes, there's, there's really nothing like that, uh, that, that DOE pool of funds. Now, I think that that could be engineered in partnership with some states policy to, to work better. I, I think it's very difficult for anyone to demonstrate an innovative new technology in the IPP wholesale market context today. Things are just so intensely competitive. Gas is so cheap. And so it's probably going to have to be done largely in the regulated context. But then you, you need permission, not from, uh, from state regulators and PSCs. And so we, for example, have been supportive of legislation in Colorado that would allow regulated entities to put innovative technology demonstrations into their IRP planning processes, uh, ideally in partnership with, with federal cost shares. And so I think that that is a, uh, maybe a necessary role for at least some states to, to, to enable that demonstration of innovative technologies. Um, and, and then as well on, on the regulatory reform front, whether you're talking about streamlining the NEPA processes so that you can actually get to yes or no on a meaningful timeline that's investable, or whether that's uh, interstate transmission or even international transmission um, siting, if we're talking about you know, bringing clean hydro down from Quebec, for example, all of that needs to be done from the federal perspective. Um, and then last, I, I, I should just say, you know, we need to take the global perspective uh, in mind. You know, If we're not taking all of this technology that we're developing here in the U.S. and exporting that to the rest of the world and displacing the new subcritical coal plants that China is helping build in Pakistan right now uh, with something better, something cleaner, then a lot of the good work we do here in the United States on this could, could simply be washed out by a rise in global emissions. And so that international role has to be coordinated, obviously, at the federal level. Well, there you have it, folks. I know we want to go to our question and answer period, uh, but uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Rich Powell and Congressman Chairman Paul Tonko. Uh, every time I chat with the two of you gentlemen, I learn a tremendous amount of things. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, in a real lightning round, predictions for next year. What, what, if anything, will come out of Congress? We'll start with you, Rich, and we'll let the chairman be the anchor. Rich? 
I think we'll have a comprehensive uh, energy innovation uh, bill, which will also be tied into infrastructure and stimulus. Great, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Well, you know, as you know, we introduced our Clean Future Act that was uh, a product of several years of reaching out to stakeholders, uh, holding roundtables and hearings and drafting uh, the legislation and now hoping to hear back as we have over the last few months as to whether or not there's further fine tuning required. Um, obviously, we don't know what the remainder of this calendar year session uh, year looks like uh, for scheduling, but um, I'm hopeful that as we return, there will be an effort for um, a clean energy uh, effort um, with uh, uh, the new session of Congress in 2021. And, um, perhaps even allow for some clean energy focused economic recovery efforts as, we, as we've seen pursued in uh, Europe. So the House Infrastructure Package, HR2, includes a number of policies that could uh, underpin our efforts. And so I think the focus will be there with the new, if it's a new administration or with the existing administration, if it's returned to office. But uh, I think a lot of challenges, maybe some hope this year if we do intensify um, uh, the, the hearing agenda to uh, make some progress uh, with uh, maybe an energy bill or some tax credit extensions. Great. And with that, I think we'll take those questions. Thank you, Chairman Tonko, and thank you, Rich Powell, for your, for your enlightened conversation. Thanks again okay. for having us. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure.